Masa. Uh, like as we were telling, no, like through all through the course, all of you would have had queries on something which is, um, which was which is the important thing. Oh, I need to know about this. This is what is the main crux of it. There comes the answer for all of that, and from someone who is the person to take us through. Welcome, Dr. Rob Gursahani. Uh, who is a consultant neurologist and epidemiologist at the Hindu Jar National Hospital, Mumbai. He has an experience list which has covered many places, which I will take you through. He is an honorary associate professor at the, in neurology at in JG Hospital, Mumbai. And he's a visiting fellow at the Cleveland Clinic, USA, and a consultant neurologist also to the Ramakrishna Mission Hospitals in Mumbai. And uh, he is in charge for the Department of Neurology at the ETN Medical College and BYL Nair Hospital, Mumbai. And he is also an important teaching faculty at the Forum of Indian Neurology Education. So we have got someone who is expert in the field. And not only that, last but not the least, and very important is he is one of the steering committee member in the elicit which is the uh, group of uh, intensivists palliative care physicians neurologists everyone who decide on the guidelines for end of life care in india so as i started off telling that is something how do i do what do i do that is what was there in many of your minds because this is not something easy so for that you're going to have a structured after this session, you will never have any of the query. Okay. With that, I hand over it to you, Dr. Rubgur Sahani, to take us through this important session. Give me a minute or two. I'm just setting it up. No yeah. worries, sir. Take your time and... Uh... Got it. Yeah. Can everybody... We can see and hear you, there. sir. So... Uh, thank you. Yeah, can can you see me? Yeah. The, yes, we can see you. We can see your presentation yes. also. So, uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, Pallium, for uh, having me on again to speak about uh, one of my favorite topics. And uh, today's uh, lecture is is actually termed a citizen's perspective because we are not just looking at this as. Uh, doctors, but also as people who perhaps eventually will need what we are going to talk about. And uh, it's important to understand that this is going to be a somewhat long lecture. It's actually split into three parts. I, uh, sorry. Uh, the first two are part one. You recognize the dying process and prognosticate. Then th third and fourth are to actually manage uh, end-of-life care and dying clinically. And the third part is the last one, is to see how this fits into the current medical-legal scenario. So let's start by asking everyone, do you think about your own death? Uh, do you think about dying with pain and suffering? This was a joke that a comedian by the name of Woody Allen made a long time ago. He said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. So remember that palliative care is actually applicable to all serious health-related suffering. But end-of-life care uh, really becomes the main part of palliative care when somebody is in the last one year of life. Now, you understand that the last one year of life is often sometimes a bit retrospective or it's a bit of guesswork and we'll describe that. When this is in the period when somebody is actively dying or when you know that the dying process has begun, then we can call it terminal care. But we prefer to use the term actively dying uh, which is based on physiological parameters. And when 
the process becomes irreversible and it lasts uh, usually days to hours, usually less than a week. So terminal illness is defined as a state from which recovery cannot be expected with uh, currently available treatments and death is considered to be unavoidable in the foreseeable future. And when you shift to end-of-life care, you shift the focus of care to symptom control, comfort, quality of life, and quality of dying with support for the family. And the important thing to remember here is that treatments aimed at cure and or prolongation of life can now be stopped. At the end of life, we can identify four natural trajectories. And this is from a paper that came out quite a while ago. They looked at uh, uh, people who passed away under Medicare in the US. Uh, I think they sampled anyone who was beyond the age of 65 or so. And random sampling captured 92% of all deaths. And they showed these four trajectories. Sudden death, where somebody who's uh, functioning absolutely normally has an event and dies. The next is terminal illness. Usually that this refers to cancer. And these also people maintain a fairly good level of function until this. <clears throat> and then you have people who have organ failure. They are usually not so well functioning. And then you have people who are frail, who are definitely not well functioning at all. And then they kind of dwindled down. Let's look at these in a little more detail. If you look at sudden death, actually after the age of 50 years, less than 10% of people die suddenly. Usually it's about 7%. And you have to have a lot of punya like uh, President Abul Kalam to die <coughs> suddenly doing what he loved doing, lecturing in his 80s. And you'll understand that all kinds of risky behaviors, whether it's soldiers, terrorists, uh, ad executors smoking too much, dowry vets, whatever. Well, obviously, none of these occur after the age of 50. By then, all of that is over. So anybody who crosses the age of 50 then is faced with one of the three next trajectories. The first we described, we spoke about was that of malignancy. Typically, this comes up with people in their 60s. And here, as I said, until, say, the second chemotherapy fails or the tumor burden starts to grow inexorably, uh, people maintain normal function. And then once they start declining, it's like a waterfall. So you know exactly or roughly when death will occur. And the prognosis becomes pretty much clear-cut. Uh, it's also once the patient and the family are aware of it, it's also a prognosis that is accepted. It accounts for a little under 20% of all deaths. You may recognize the picture of uh, our former defense minister and then the Goa chief minister, Manohar Parikar. When he came back from Delhi to talk, take charge of uh, Goa again, I'm sure he knew his time was up. What about organ failure? Well, these are people who have developed various kinds of organ failure. Um, this could be due to ba bad diabetes or blood pressure or could be de novo. So kidney, heart, lung, liver failure accounts for about 15% of all deaths. And these are usually people in their 70s. And this is called the looping or the entry reentry trajectory. So they run into a crisis, get into hospital, get a little better, but not totally. And then this continues. They loop until finally they pass away during a crisis. Uh, not many of you recognize, may recognize this picture. This is the former chief minister of uh, Maharashtra, uh, Vilasov Deshmukh. And he died waiting for a liver transplant uh, because of liver failure. And very often, patient, family, nobody uh, is aware that this, is, that this trajectory is proceeding. And then you have the last natural trajectory, and this is the trajectory of frailty, old age, dementia. And this will take away about 50% of us, uh, those of us who manage to reach the 80s. We call this the 
dwindling frailty or dementia trajectory. Uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee lost the general election in 2004. And uh, we practically did not hear of him until he actually passed away. He just vanished. And this is what, to some extent, explains that decline that happened. And then there are two not-so-natural trajectories. These are actually trajectories which are artifacts of modern intensive care. The first actually has been termed the fifth trajectory, where somebody has a catastrophic event. It could be, of course, something that hits the brain stroke or traumatic brain injury. And these are patients who are rescued by critical care. Otherwise, they would have died. And then they remain you know, low level of functioning until they finally pass away. Uh, it's important to understand that this could be a systemic event in somebody who's old or very old. Somebody in the 80s with a hip fracture, uh, post-surgery, post-ICU, never returning to normal. But more typically, this is the trajectory of neurocritical illness. Uh, Michael Schumacher, uh, finished his racing career and had a skiing accident. I think it was in 2013. And he, three or four years, I remember later, I remember reading that he could still not walk unaided. We, we really don't know because the family is very you know, private about his state. But this is typical of neurocritical illness. The brain is hit by a, a truck, a bomb, a bullet, a plot, or whatever. And in previous decades, that is an individual who would have died. But intensive care rescues them. They may still die or they may still stay in the persistent vegetative state. But a small number of them, not the majority, start to improve and improve with disability. So that's the sixth trajectory. Now in all these trajectories, it's our responsibility to foresee and to foretell. Not just death, but what is going to happen and how it is going to happen. This is because, so, yeah, this is because in some ways, it is actually a bioethical responsibility. You cannot take consent for whatever you do unless the individual knows what is happening to them. And yet, we find it very difficult to do because patients expect us to uh, prognosticate honestly, accurately, and optimistically. But if we know how to do it, if we know how to foretell, then we also obviously have to know how to foresee. And that is where we are heading to next. So you will have understood from this that most deaths can be anticipated, though a minority are unexpected. And the earlier you recognize the final decline, you can make sure that people live and die in the place and manner of their choice. And I strongly urge you to go to this website and look at the wealth of information that is available there, goldstandardsframework.org.uk. So can we recognize terminal illness when you know that somebody is nearing the end of life? And there are four triggers. And I'll discuss them in detail. The first is the surprise question. The second is general indicators of decline. Then there are specific clinical indicators related to the condition. And then there are decisions. I'm going to just take a minute because I have to respond to a message. So if there are any questions, I don't mind taking a couple of questions before we go on beyond this. In the chat box, so we can wait. Nothing. Okay, fine. So let's go on. So the surprise question is actually when you ask yourself intuitively, uh, would you be surprised if this patient were to die in the next one year? And you'd say, no, I would not be surprised. Of course, you could change the time frame and take next few months, weeks, days. And uh, it 
of course, has to be intuitive. It puts together clinical comorbidities, social and other factors to get a whole picture of deterioration. And the accuracy <clears throat> is close to 80% in oncology. Even in non-oncology, it's about 70%. It's more to do with the experience of the individual who's, the clinician who's making this assessment. There are other indicators, general indicators of decline that you can monitor more systematically. As I said, the first one is intuitive. The Of these, the first is decreasing activity. As somebody's performance goes down, they are not able to take care of themselves. And they are in bed or chair more than 50% of the day. And they're dependent most activities of daily living. You know that they probably have less time to live. But this has to be done systematically. And it also, to some extent, depends on the disease that you're looking at. So, uh, for instance, you have uh, the Karnofsky performance score and the palliative performance scale in oncology, and you have the FAST scale for dementia. Together with this decline, you also look at comorbidity. And that is obvious. The more illnesses one has, the more likely that things will not go well. Uh, obviously, if the disease itself is advanced, and sometimes it may not be the obvious thing. For instance, in Parkinson's, it may not be the movements. It may be the fact that the constipation has now become obstipation. Or somebody is now requiring oxygen. Then, which also means that the treatments are no longer working. So diabetes is not getting controlled. And as above, somebody is more breathless and requiring oxygen. Some numbers can be followed. Weight loss greater than 10%. That may be a little nonspecific. One thing that I find useful to follow is when the albumin is consistently below 2.5. Another number is repeated unplanned or crisis admissions. So more than three admissions in six months and you need to watch out. And then there is something called the sentinel event. The sentinel event uh, could be a serious fall with a fracture neck femur, but it could also be psychosocial. The loss of a spouse. So you need to pay attention to all of this. And then, of course, you have disease-specific guidelines. Now, these are most specific for cancer. So if there is recurrence or metastasis of the initial therapy, which means stage 4 disease, and the patient has multimorbidities and there is no further chemotherapy possible, you know that there is not too much time left. And in such a patient, if they are spending more than 50% of their time in bed or lying down, the prognosis is estimated to be about three months or less. For organ failures, it tends to be erratic and unpredictable. And I'm not going to spend too much time going over this. This is all from the gold standards framework. And you can look this up and actually uh, take this down for your use. Uh, the most complex, of course, tends to be uh, neurology because there are so many different indicators and different markers. But even there, there are some things that we need to pay attention to. And that one thing, uh, rather than something, the one thing is decisions that we make. Remember that when you are dealing with oncology, once the decline begins, it's the tumor that makes all the ethical decisions, the clinical decisions. And patient, family, clinicians accept it. But when it comes to neurologic decline or with frailty and multimorbidities, and when somebody is deteriorating with symptoms which are complex and too difficult to control, including swallowing and speech problems, it is often the decision not to take on any further treatments or to go back to hospital again or to go to the ICU again, that marks the beginning of the end. So I'm going to take you through uh, three cases and uh, you will see how this plays out. The first is this uh, gentleman who was 81 uh, when first diagnosed early dementia, started on medication, treated for mild depression. And when he asked, he himself asked his neurologist, what is going to happen to me? Well, there was no meaningful discussion. 
he had been slowing down for about a couple of years and he had realized that so he had kind of quit his responsibilities and lived with his wife and uh, in the suburbs of mumbai uh, with both children in the us and you can see 2014 diagnosis 2015 independent daily routine but minor issues coming up wearing simpler clothes once lost in the neighborhood asking wife questions again and again by 2016 started to need more and more supervision uh, including coming out of the bath once uh, and shadowing the wife constantly he couldn't leave her out of his sight and by 2017 his behavioral issues started to get worse he would not very be very cooperative for bathing and clothes changing and uh, uh, one episode of night time wandering he managed to get out of the house fortunately the building chokidar noticed him and got him back home and uh, um, in fact uh, at that time uh, in fact his wife was getting so uh, i mean she needed admission for ischemic heart disease by january 2018 was his first admission he came in with urinary tract infection and uh, delirium and he was discharged with a suprapubic cystostomy he could still walk after that but conversation was little quite limited very little that he could say and now the wife had to ask ab kya hoga and the neurologist said well old age end of that year continued decline and then he came in again with hyponatremia again corrected but in spite of that he remained bed down and nearly mute and by now everything all basic activity of daily living were dependent one and a half months later he came in with recurrent generalized seizures and uh, all of the fits were controlled with drugs that didn't suppress respiration uh, well he got intubated uh, he in fact quickly got weaned off the ventilator there were no fresh changes on the ct head and for unclear reasons a tracheostomy was put in on day 8 but when the family was then asked for a peg they really now needed to be convinced uh i wasn't involved to the round of this stage but finally the peg was done and he was discharged for home care on day 28 uh on discharge he was effectively in the persistent vegetative state and the us based son really asked us directly couldn't palliative care have been involved earlier uh over a period of time he developed bed sores finally the last episode was uh, a vomit aspiration and he passed away at home fortunately so if you look at the missed opportunities for this patient at diagnosis had he been told that this was dementia was is a terminal illness and that he was likely to deteriorate or at least by the time of the first uti the family could have been informed that he's now going downhill uh if that had been done then the second admission would have been focused on comfort and avoiding future hospitalizations maybe even with seizures he might not even have needed to be admitted the intubation probably would not have been done and uh, the tracheostomy instead of the tracheostomy if he did need it it could have been a palliative extubation the last stage of his illness and the family's suffering would have been cut short by at least 3 months so let's look at the flip side the exact opposite of this almost the same age a gentleman with a completely different diagnosis uh again only daughter in the us living in mumbai with wife retired develops constipation blood in stool uh adenocarcinoma in the colon is identified and he is referred to an oncologist and an onco surgeon and he gets a left hemicolectomy and as often happens the discussion with the oncologist all that he remembered was the emotional content that he got um we do tend to talk over or away from the patient and he actually said that he the oncologist spoke to my daughter not to me but anyway he was put on chemotherapy which he tolerated well and something more happened uh just after the chemotherapy was completed uh his us based grandson made sure that he had a palliative care consult uh he went on to have his regular three monthly follow up 
and unfortunately the follow up pet ct at the end of that year showed extensive metastases had appeared uh with a projected survival of 4 months and he was offered palliative chemo with targeted therapy and you know that now there are more and more chemotherapies coming up um uh, in fact in this case at that point he was offered a median survival of just under a year maybe even up to 2 years and he said no enough um so the palliative care team did a home visit hospice care was set up at home to manage his symptoms and then watch what happened uh, he had a prolonged discussion with the palliative care team together with his wife and the daughter and grandson um the grandson had actually got a new job but he flew to mumbai with two months of leave to take care of his uh, grandfather and made sure that the documentation for the wishes was done in may 2018 the final decline began appetite was down the daughter was informed she flew in and literally he waited to greet her and then he passed away so if you see the difference between neurologic and or non oncologic death versus cancer death in cancer death the trajectory and the prognosis is very well defined and it is once there is reasonable transparency it is accepted by everybody admissions can be avoided and patients and family retain control if there is transparency here in non oncologic deaths the trajectory is erot- erratic and prolonged you can have recurrent admissions that that may really be unavoidable and in dementia very early the person loses their person loses control and expensive and avoidable icu care at the very end is almost the default but we also need to look at old age remember that human life expectancy regardless of what you hear and read is not expected to increase much beyond 80 years we also have to look at chronologic age versus biologic age so you'll see some people who at the age of 90 look like they're 70 and some people who at the age of 70 look like they're 90 so you need to be aware of both chronologic and biologic age but 80 is probably the tipping point and you have to identify sentinel events so this was a lady who moved out of mumbai to a place called nasik with her 87 year old husband because their only daughter lived there she had poorly controlled diabetes and she had had spells of complications so the daughter said nothing doing you have to be close to me and she was otherwise well settled into the new home uh, as usual uh, you know not wanting servants been very independent but the daughter insisted and she developed a active social life in 2016 uh, little under 2 years after they moved she had a febrile diarrheal illness 6 months later that was followed by a fracture neck fever uh, she had transient post op delirium then recovered well and began to walk with a walker at about 3 months uh early the next year about 5 months after her fracture the husband collapsed after 3 days of weak chest pain uh, he was a little over 90 i think 90 years old uh and he had developed lower pneumonia and cystitis multi organ failure came up and our patient actually confirmed dna and dnr for her husband and he passed away 48 hours after admission how did this happen well soon after her second illness both husband and wife spoke to their daughter and made it clear that there were going to be no heroic measures in fact both of them wanted their bodies to be donated So in 2017 in spite of the fact that she had lost her husband well uh, her favorite person moved in to live with her and she actually bounced back emotionally except that another 8 months later she herself ran into a problem and this time it was that her diabetes which was never well controlled she developed multiple superficial soft tissue abscesses was admitted twice given iv antibiotics twice and then by early march 2018 she was discharged for home care with dressings and when she asked what is happening to me she was told that the medicines the antibiotics are not working and we are going to manage this way she understood and she said 
I don't want to go to hospital again. And she was a pretty strong lady. She refused any painkillers stronger than paracetamol. This was early March 2018. By April 2018, the decline had begun. She was in bed most of the time. Uh, when we look at basic activities of daily living, we look at the ability to transfer out of the bed to a chair, uh, maintaining continence, toileting, bathing, dressing, and eating. Um, this eating was the only thing that she could do on her own. And that too started to decline. By the second week of June, uh, she started to become delirious. Uh, and she did seem to be in pain, uh, moan, moaning even on turning over in bed. Uh, then her vitals started to decline. The urine quantity started to come down. Three days after this had begun, she stopped speaking. And she stopped breathing later this Sunday. So when you are faced with this kind of a situation, where obviously these are individuals who are ill, but do not have any clear-cut diagnosis, you can see from cancer, where the situation is clearest, to dementia, where, well, complications determine what is going to happen, to this, just sheer old age. How do you identify who are the people who are likely to pass away? Now, whenever people have tried to study this, they found that this is not something where you can uh, be very accurate. If you look at uh, the earlier prognostication that I spoke about, 70 to 80 percent. Uh, here, actually, the best we can do is 60 to 70 percent, very often. So, uh, the previous paper showed you a comparison of six scales, but this is the scale that I use most often. This is called the Walter Index. It's not very new, but I find it useful even to explain it to patients and families. Uh, the risk factors are listed here. So if somebody has all activities of daily living dependent, say, that gives them five points. If they have uh, chronic renal failure, add another two. If on top of it, they have congestive heart, heart failure, add another two. So you can see how this goes. This becomes nine. And Anybody who has more than six points has about more than a 60% chance of passing away in the following one year, it's somewhere between 60 and 70%. If they have only four points, then their mortality is like the rest of the community. And you can see. So when you identify somebody in this situation, remember that if you speak to a family member, they will say, ha, 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 so it's, she has only about 50-60% chance of passing. So that's not the point. If there are 10 people in this cohort, 6 to 7 of them will pass away in the first year. Out of the remaining 3 or 4, 60 to 70% will pass away in the next year. Out of the remaining 1 or 2, what is going to happen? And then they understand that this means an individual who probably has or very likely has less than three years to live. Uh, these are not discussions that we normally have with families. Now, remember that this is a responsibility that we have. We call it serious illness communication. Uh, before the middle of the 20th century, diagnosis, therapeutics, and prognosis were three equally important functions. As medical treatments improved in the last century, the skill of prognosis declined in teaching, research, and in practice. Uh, and remember that prognostication has to combine foreseeing and foretelling. I actually put it the other way around and say that if you do not commit and learn how to foretell, and when you foretell, you have to be honest, accurate, but also optimistic. And you can do that using communication skills. If you do not commit to foretelling, your foresight will atrophy because your foresight is not going to be used. So when you need to start to start speaking to people about end of life care, the first thing that we, we split this up into three uh, major topics. The first is goals of care. Okay. This is our responsibility. You have to combine it with patient education. 
This means what are can we expect? What can we do? And it supplements usual discussion about treatments. It's basically a process of patient and family education. Then, of course, with this, you need to understand what these goals of care can be. Now, if you look at medical care of any kind, remember that our goals of medical care are essentially three. Longevity, function, and comfort. And when you speak to families, as you're speaking to families, you will find out which of these three are important. Because ideally, of course, we'd like to manage all three. But there are times when we have to prioritize. And it is a discussion with the patient and family that allows you to decide which is priority number one. Longevity, function, or comfort. And uh, these can be uh, understood as values, as wishes, as preferences, or even as duties. Avoiding becoming a burden. Uh, I'm not sure that you understand that actually in in the Indic religions, this is somewhat upside down. Uh, there are many people who believe that suffering is is essential at the end of life, spiritually. So that their karma is complete. So these are these are nuances that you need to discuss and understand. So when you do this, you set goals of care. You have to find out how much they understand, how much they want to know. You have to explain uncertainty. But probably the first thing you need to do is find out the patient's wishes about place of care. Do they want to pass away at home or in hospital? And does the caregiver agree? So when you do this, then you reach the next stage, and that is advanced care planning. Now This means that this information is documented. It's made actionable. The first priority is to choose a proxy decision maker. And uh, ideally, this has to be legally valid and backed by public policy. In India, it is now legally valid, but there is no public policy to back it. So this is still an individual responsibility. And then having done this, you can then embark on shared decision making, where you combine patient or family inputs, values, preferences with our inputs, prognosis, what is feasible, and you make appropriate in-the-moment decisions. Um, specific end-of-life decisions that need to be made, one is preferred place and or care of death, and life-saving treatments. Does somebody want CPR? Do they want ventilation? Uh, remember that mode of feeding when the patient is unable to take oral feeds, such as Ryle's tube and peg, are also life-saving treatments. Parental medications, other than those required for symptom control, such as pain and so on, are also life-saving treatments that can be avoided. You don't need to get antibiotics. If you do it well, it improves the patient's quality of life and they get a sense of control over their own last days. It reduces the burden, conflict, stress, anxiety, PTSD in surviving family members. And the system is less burdened. The challenges are, well, everybody is afraid of death and find it difficult to think or talk. But the more important issue is that clinicians find it difficult to discuss prognosis and often say, no time, no time. Now, well, families are not expected to see this decline. It is our job. But often we don't see it or see it and ignore it or don't know how to handle it. And I can assure you that if you do not know how to foretell, your foresight will inevitably atrophy. Now, communication is a learned skill. As much a learned skill as surgery or diagnostics, it requires training, as you will realize at Pallium. It requires practice. Ideally, it should be followed by assessment and certification. Finally, you begin to perform it. And when you perform it, you perform it like any procedure. You prepare for the procedure, you go through the procedure, you come back and think about what you did well and what did not go well. And hopefully, you're better the next time. Um, whenever I'm talking to my senior colleagues that they need to learn communication skills, or even hinting at it, this is me. The problem is, there's a Hindi song which says, 
Papu can't dance, sir. Unfortunately, Papu doesn't know that he can't dance. Right. I'm going to stop at this point. Part one is over. And we'll take some questions before we go on to part two. If there are no questions, I will just... Any questions? At present, there's nothing in the chat box. But if anybody wants to unmute and ask, you can go ahead and do. In the chat box, Dr. there's Rada? nothing at present. Uh. Okay, Dr. Rada, we'll then I think we'll move on. So, Carry please. on. Carry on. Yeah, yeah. It's ideally... So, this was the first part about prognostication. And then we move on to the phase of managing end-of-life care. Now, how do we know when a person is actively dying? These are purely clinical signs and symptoms. It's important to understand and recognize this because these are clear-cut physiological declines. If you remember my third patient, you could make out when it had begun. Uh, you need to prepare the family and caregivers. The care needs to become multidisciplinary and holistic. And remember that our care has to go on to after death and psychological care. Months to weeks before death, this is called pre-active dying. This you could call the terminal stage. Psych physical and psychosocial withdrawal. Begins. Movement gets less. Uh, people start to withdraw from family and friends. Oral intake declines. Occasional incontinence. And weight loss and albumin decline. All of those become. Weeks to days before death, the first feature, and obviously this is in non-neurology patients, uh, is delirium. The appearance of delirium is marked by episodes of confusion. Together with that, vital signs also start to decline. And the patient now is confined to bed and there's reduced communication and inability to speak. And when death is imminent, vital signs decline. So consciousness, breathing, hemodynamic changes, the face changes, it becomes yellow. Uh, there is inability to swallow secretion, so you get what is termed a death rattle. And for me, what I find pretty much specific is when breathing develops a mandibular component. We recognize this as gasping. All of us recognize it. But we don't pin it down and say, okay, active dying, imminent death is, is around the corner. Uh, we don't know why gasping occurs at this stage, but it is believed to be due to brainstem hypoxia. Uh, there's some amount of uh, uh, very little literature from people who undergo CPR and so on. But uh, uh, remember that if you see it, uh, that's a very important sign. And when you see somebody who's dying, remember that your goal is to Ensure the patient's comfort. Make the end of life peaceful and dignified. Make the memory of the dying pro process as positive as possible for their carers. And uh, you have to uh, look at the medicines, manage refractory symptoms. But overall, you have to focus on comfort. Uh, one major challenge is that oral decline, oral intake goes down. Appetite is gone, food aversion, nausea, stomatitis, multiple reasons. And... Families need to understand that uh, feeding tubes do not enhance survival or quality of life at the end of life. If you put in a rice tube, you have to tie them down. And very often they start developing decubitai with that. Neither do feeding tubes reduce the risk of aspiration or pneumonia. If you are giving artificial hydration, whether it is clinically assisted nutrition, which means the rice tube or egg tube, or uh, parenteral, review the rate, volume, according to individual needs, so that complications related to overhydration are avoided. You, you, it's, it's sickening to see a completely bloated body at the end of life. So typically, uh, these are patients where uh, you will be okay if they pass urine about three to four times a day. Uh, if at all, you have to feed, provide the food items that the patient likes. Uh, this may be mashed. Nutritious supplements are useless. And what you can focus on is good mouth care with ice pieces and moistening and lubrication of the lips. The family has to understand that the body is shutting down and intake is going down, not the other way around. 
total fluid requirement is about 1 liter per day you can give it subcutaneously and as i said earlier if the patient is passing urine three to four times per day you are still about a few days out um and we call this the feeding at this stage hand feeding you can do it with a spoon also but remember that families can be told that this this person had fed you with her hands when you were a child can't you do that now the medicines are concerned you stop all medicines that are not required uh, important medicines that need to be continued uh, ideally should be given subcutaneously and you can understand intravenous antibiotics are not required aspirin and statin are for years into the future typically with declining intake oral hypoglycemic medications are not required if you are monitoring sugar even insulin may not be required psychotropics all those can stop uh, of course these are two that may require a certain amount of discussion and planning but uh, they can all be stopped and the end of life care symptoms that are really important to manage first is pain then delirium or agitation incontinence dyspnea nausea and vomiting are all there and all of these are treatable uh, if required medications can be given by various routes but the commonest route used in palliative care is subcutaneous and i'm sure you've been trained about that but if you have a line that you could use that you could use these other routes but uh, much less convenient um pain is the most common symptom uh, it has varied presentations if you're not able to assess it verbally use a validated scale and it's best if it is anticipated and treated effectively with opioids sometimes with severe pain you may require to titrate it very rapidly what if somebody is restless or agitated the first thing is to look for the environment um non pharmacologic measures will focus on retention constipation and pain uh you put on glasses increase natural light cut down medicines remove tubes reduce stimulating noise and ideally protect the patient's sleep uh and if you do that this can be done even in a busy icu if this doesn't work if nothing else is found then pharmacologically probably haloperidol is the easiest to use uh benzodiazepines are not recommended because they can worsen delirium and they are never the first choice until you unless you are actually uh, looking at severe major sedation so if you're not then it's it's best to use haloperidol what about breathlessness remember that you must correct the correctable uh with uh, fluorocentesis diuretics bronchodilators uh air movement on the face always helps and this uh so typically a fan is it's been shown to be very useful you can reduce the perception of dyspnea by using morphine and anxiolytics and if it is intolerable and refractory palliative sedation may be required for nausea and vomiting again you take this reverse reversible as the first principle constipation hypokalemia hypocalcemia may need to be managed first line drugs are metoclopramide but you can go on to haloperidol uh, metoclopramide and ondansetron but you can go on to haloperidol uh, haloperidol uh, dexamethasone also helps sedation also helps and then these are the other drugs olanzapine i've never used but it is there in the list all right what about the death rattle now the death rattle typically is pooled secretions in the upper airway and in 50% of patients uh is a predictor of death usually within 72 hours type 1 is when it is in the pharynx and type 2 is when it is in the bronchi the family has to be educated that this is not causing any distress to the patient ideal management is non pharmacological so you reposition them with the neck extended suctioning has to be avoided because it's only creates more pain and actually stimulates more secretions ideally you should use a uh, i mean with a finger wrapped in a gauze piece and get it out but pharmacological means like gly- glycoparolate and hyoscine are pretty useful uh, scopolamine is usually avoided for the nurses it's important to remember mouth care pressure sore prevention 
police categorization if needed, and obviously you do need to monitor them for conservation. And as you prepare for the end, remember that our, most people will just fade out, but there are two dramatic uh, uh, situations. The first are fits or epileptic situations. This obviously is more likely in neuro cases, but it can happen in other illnesses also. So the first is you prevent harm. Don't force objects into the mouth. Uh, obviously, if somebody who's dying, you do not want to give oral medication. And you ask the doctor for subcutaneous midazolam or anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, these have to be prescribed, made available to the family if you are anticipating this. Otherwise, you have to bring it in immediately. Remember that somebody who's in status will gradually become unconscious, will become quiet. And although electrical activity is going on in the brain, visible seizures will stop. And the family distress usually uh, depends on visible seizures. The other, even more dramatic event is the blowout hemorrhage. Oral malignancy can infiltrate neck arteries. And when that starts to happen, this has to be discussed in advance. Uh, what you do is apply steady pressure with dark towels, preferably green, so that it's not seen, and sedate the patient quickly. Usually, this, this doesn't obviously also last very long. In some patients, symptoms are so difficult to control that you have to use what is termed palliative sedation. Now, remember that people have argued that palliative sedation is equivalent to euthanasia. It is not. Here, you're sedating the patient to make them sleep comfortably. Uh, the natural process is allowed to continue. But with what you do, death may be hastened. We call this the double leg effect. And you can see how this is different from euthanasia, at least in terms of the uh, in terms of uh, the process and the outcomes. Together, through this, you have to support the family because the family may be suffering as much or even more than the patient to address their various needs. Uh, obviously, a palliative care team, if it is involved, it works well. When you when death occurs at home, remember that your job is to uh, confirm this. So confirm identity, watch for signs of life, check for response, feel for pulse, and document. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. You can probably look at it later. Remember that the family needs bereavement support uh, for palliative care teams where opioids have been used. Your responsibility is to collect back unused op opioids. Uh, to the family, you have to explain the wave character of grief. Grief comes up and goes down. So they have to be helped to manage this. Normal grief can last up to six months. Complicated grief, which requires medical help, can go beyond that. Uh, when you are supporting the family, remember that if you explain what is happening, what is likely to happen, prepare them. It prevents panic. And you have to be available to answer questions. There may be religious concerns, there may be wishes of the patient, and you may need to enlist help from the community. So remember that everybody who undergoes this process, the caregivers, uh, grief is the natural distress that is expressed after, experienced afterwards. Mourning is the outward expression of the grief. Uh, everyone will experience grief uniquely, which is based on culture, the nature of loss. Sudden death is probably the most traumatic. But when somebody is old and gradually fading out, probably less. Um, we also recognize these three types of grief. Acute grief, uh, that follows the death or loss of a loved one and takes a certain period of adapting to life without the deceased. When this is integrated into normal life uh, with an understanding of the finality and the consequences of the loss, we call it integrated. We call it complicated grief when it extends for a period of time beyond the loss that is not acceptable even by the social, cultural, religious norms. Typically, uh, we look at this at anything longer than six months. And throughout this period, we are needed to provide support. Uh, 
identify caregivers who are at risk of complicated grief, connect with helplines in the community. And uh, ideally, a palliative care team should have bereavement support meetings where they can all come together. So this is the last slide of part one and two. Remember that Terminal illness can be identified, focus has to shift to symptom control, active dying must be recognized, and family support begins before death and continues. I'm going to stop again, the end of part two, uh, check if there are questions, and then move on. No I questions, also have, sir. Okay, I also need to answer a WhatsApp. Oh, right. So, now, if you look at all of this, why is it that we don't do all of this? This is obviously so important. If you ask lay persons, they say that, well, is there any money to be made out of this? So they think these are because of perverse incentives. Uh, some people may even say that corporate hospitals make money out of the dying. So I was, there's a joke uh, which I was told which says that a corporate hospital is one which the poor cannot enter and the rich cannot leave. But remember that from the doctor's side, uh, what I often hear is that there is no legal clarity. Uh, one is that there is no law that says thou shalt, thou shalt not on pain off. And on the flip side, we are worried about criminal charges and litigation, which is, think, which is I think, wrong. But yes, we are not forced to do this. Also, there are the difficulties in establishing prognosis. prognosis. But I think the most important, which nobody ever comments on, is the complete lack of capacity. We are not trained. We have no skills in managing palliative end-of-life care and the community skills that you need to carry this through. And nobody even realizes that we don't have this capacity. Now, if you look how this is handled across the world, remember that uh, at the top you have obvious ethics, and in a country like ours, where we have a written constitution, there is something called constitutional morality. What is right, what is wrong. And the judges do say this. You must have heard this term. Uh, on the other side is our own practice. Ideally, there is there are considered guidelines and policies. And judgments and laws come somewhere in between. Uh, if you remember uh, uh, the term Zietgeist, is a German word. It means the spirit of the time. Till about the middle of the last century, it was doctor knows best. Human equality was not something that we accepted. So only after that, we realized that we and our patients are equal. We are humans together. Um, then medical progress came up with antibiotics, ICU care, organ transplants, and survival became ubiquitous. People would go into ICUs and survive and come out. Before that, if you became seriously ill, it was literally your luck. And death became medicalized. So it was no longer a natural process. It was something that you managed medically. Uh, from the 1970s onwards, medical paternalism began to end. Informed consent had already started 30s, 40s. And patient autonomy and rights became more and more prominent. Living wills were first brought up as a human rights issue. And because uh, the way their states function, it became a competitive thing between individual states. And the USA became the world's laboratory for these issues. Finally, the US Parliament, the US Congress, wrote out something called the Patient Self-Determination Act. It's actually pretty simple. It, all that it says is that any patient who comes into a hospital which is funded by the central government will be asked if they have a living will or if they want to make money. <coughs> On the other side, 
palliative care began in the United Kingdom and began to rise and to spread. Uh, if you look at ethics, remember that we have to we think of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, justice, but there are others also, dignity, honesty, empathy, compassion, which we don't categorize as specific ethics, but they're also part of what we do. If you want to put all of this together, remember that you either follow medical indications or you follow patient preference or you look at quality of life outcomes or you may be looking at contextual features. If anybody is interested, I strongly recommend that you look at what is called the four box model. But again, I will not really have the time to discuss it here. What is the legal framework that we have? It all starts with the constitution of India. We are a common law <coughs> country, which means uh, not everything is written down in law, but it's also dependent on judge interpretation. The only act that we have is the Transplantation of Human Organs Act, but we have Supreme Court judgments. We have professional guidelines. And uh, we have, obviously, the Constitution of India. I have been involved with this topic since 2011. I was part of the medical team that examined Aruna Shamba. And since then, uh, the things have been moving. In 2015, the three uh, uh, National Medical Associations of Neurologists intensivists and palliative care physicians came together and uh, we started to work on this topic. Now remember that in 2011, this whole decision making was clearly decriminalized. So anybody who says that an FIR will be filed if I withdraw, that's rubbish. In 2011, this was very clear. Of course, uh, the judge did not uh, confirm that Aruna was in the vegetative state and since her next of kin, which are the nurses, did not want to, he put down the principles, but he didn't take action in that case. But there was other action that was happening based on this. And the one of the main things were these guidelines uh, for end of life and palliative care, uh, which was jointly written up by the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine and the Indian Association of Palliative Care in 2014. In 2015, we, the neurologists, also joined up. And then in 2018 came this mammoth judgment. Five judges who actually said very, very clearly that all adults with the capacity to consent have the right of self-determination at all. A competent person who has come of age has the right to refuse specific treatment. All treatment opt for an alternative treatment even if a decision entails a risk of death. You can treat them in emergency only when it is not practicable to obtain the patient's consent. But where a patient has already put down their wishes in an advanced directive, which is free from reasonable doubt, then such directive has to be given effect to if he or she does not wish to be treated. So uh, before the pandemic began, our group had worked on this. Uh, we had documents from Piki, uh, Manipal has the Blue Maple document. Uh, we put together, I was part of the group that wrote, wrote up uh, DNAR uh, orders for the ICMR and the uh, uh, Ames Delhi wrote up a very nice uh, guideline for end of life care. But the procedure that the judges had given in the 2018 judgment was still rather difficult. So it was not until January 24, 2023 that another five judge bench looked at this and actually simplified the process. Um, now, you will say that uh, these are only judgments. Remember that no country has comprehensive end-of-life care legislation. As of now, these judgments are the law of the land. Remember, as I told you, if you are looking at patient autonomy, you have to inform and communicate. We've already spoken about this. For those people who believe that if we make these decisions, we are liable to be sued, well, actually, it's the other way around. In, this was an article in 2021. And in the US, uh, people, doctors are usually getting sued, if at all, for what is termed wrongful life had so much more suffering and they're winning suits. 
for us remember that poor end of life care is one of the major causes of the systemic distrust of the medical profession in india legally we have no excuses for not addressing this issue how do we do this the due process that we follow is that you have to have a consensus between the people who are treating the patient uh if the patient is competent then obviously the patient makes decisions if the patient cannot and there is if you if there is a advanced medical directive then you follow that if there is no advanced medical directive then you identify appropriate surrogates disclose terminal illness do shared decision making and then proceed the first step is that the treating team which means at least three consultants we call this the first end of life committee or the primary medical board uh you have to confirm consensus on both sides then you complete documentation and then within 48 hours the hospital has to have this reviewed by the second end of life care committee It's, this is called the uh, the secondary medical board and this whole process has to be completed in 48 hours at after which withdrawal can happen for all of us it's important to remember that the best way to uh, handle this is to make a valid living will or advanced medical directive uh, we can all begin by speaking to those close to us choose our surrogates or healthcare power of attorneys then make an advanced medical directive uh, till january 2023 it needed to be attested by a judicial magistrate first class that is gone it can be attested by a notary or a gazetted government officer that is it and of course two witnesses have to count sir um if you look around on the pallium website you'll find this document this is the one that uh, we work together and it is also sponsored by the ipc as well and you can actually download it and use it um it's important i tell patients that you have to show it to every doctor you consult ideally we think it should be entered in the hospital record and if it is entered in the hospital record hospitals will be due to bound to follow it what if this is not done what if we let default carry on remember we now have the means to keep the body alive indefinitely should we choose to do so in 2018 atal bihari passed away in august four months before him and three months after him the two bushes who were about the same age they were all in their 90s the two bushes passed away in their own beds they were literally in darbar they were cats dogs children grandchildren friends everybody around them and they passed away suddenly atal bihari died on extra corporeal membrane oxygenation after 10 or i don't know how many days think of a 94 year old subjected to all that lata mangeshkar well those incomparable vocal, vocal card cords were raped not once but twice he died after second so my rule is that if you are an indian vip you are condemned to torture before that oh uh, i'm sure you got these take home messages that there is a predictable trajectory we need empathetic communication we need anticipatory guidance if you do appropriate symptom management patients get a dignified dying process and if you pay attention to the bereavement phase the family can re-enter their lives i'm going to stop at this point uh, and uh, hand over back to dr raza thank you very much uh no word to say like in length and also what all their queries no you have given them uh in in a fine plate i'm not asking say. any queries Uh, that's why see no because it's so clear and uh, it it only thing no there's always from your speak i i like the foreseeing and foretelling uh, for that little bit of uh, when the knowledge is there the fear will go away lack uh, of knowledge and lack of awareness is the reason for the fear is that's what i feel uh, and so that one also they need not have any more and Somebody especially that album uh that album in is something very very useful as anesthetist we used to have um, 
some reasons when we take patients like 85 and 90 year olds for theater that is one thing which we have always looked into and it is uh, it gives you an idea of what will be the post operative outcome so that is something very very useful um coming to the que questions in the chat box what about cases where family members have a different opinion from the advance directive that is what you said okay so, so it's i yeah hmm. so so that uh, see ideally hmm, uh i think that if the if the so the advance directive is a document right that's why now we use the term advanced care planning process and the process is a conversation if the family has had this discussion if death has been normalized then these disputes are quite uncommon and it's our business to facilitate these discussions when we know somebody is in their last years of life now uh, if in spite of that family members have a different opinion from their advanced directive so one of the things that uh, this was a senior professor of neurology she said uh, 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 my husband because he will never let go so i have made my son my uh, 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 surrogate to make these decisions so obviously you have to speak and decide and uh, if this discussion is had i doubt if uh, people have that kind um uh what is this spb the length of prolonged ah, uh, that is um, that uh, jay jalita is like still like a mystery. yeah but that mystery because there is no transfer bala subramanyam the singa okay so if there is no see with vips there is no transparency there is no transparency this is the culture look at the bushes literally it was in the paper jimmy carter has announced that he is going home and he is not coming to us so abroad it is expected that vips will take the lead in india where chodo it will happen it will happen don't worry about that matter of time uh, references be shared there are so many huh. references that I'm, i think gold standards framework is the first one that you must be see your your presentation as such will be shared for them sir so in that right. itself you got if so many if you do uh, i mean uh, yeah you'll get the what presentation i mean if there's anything you want you can check from there and no. somebody has asked uh, for bmc medical article what is that bmc medical article um uh, drop Drop me a mail, please. I don't remember which one now. Ah, that's okay. What, anyway, maybe the procedure for uh, making an advance medical that. directive is it a legal document? Yeah, yeah. So okay, you can share my uh, email ID and uh, okay. Ah, he is also a neurologist. The procedure for making an advance medical directive. Okay. And the Swami is a neuro intensivist. Okay. Uh, so why don't you join the? Uh, international mm -hmm. neuro palliative care certificate course <laughs> we are about to start september 1 i'll uh, with your permission i'll share the link um so once the case is being presented i'll put the link for the international neuro palliative care certificate course uh, which i'm running the next batch starts on the 1st of september okay procedure for making an advanced medical directive okay the procedure is uh, you have to uh, identify a document the sample document you know the one that we have put up and it's there is a set of faqs at the end uh ideally the most important part of it is to identify your uh, healthcare agent your healthcare proxy people who will take these decisions then you have to figure out whether you are giving them any discretion or you are uh, only telling them that you please comply with my wishes uh once you have done that then uh, and chosen what you want don't want then you have it uh signed i mean you sign it together with two witnesses in front of the notary what we recommend is after that is done the notary you get copies made the notary can attest them and these attested copies 
you have to then see that they go into your medical records. They are available to the whole family. Uh, so that everybody who needs to be aware is made aware of them. Uh, we are also supposed to, uh, I mean, that mechanism is not yet set up. That is also to be sent to a government repository. At this moment, we don't know what that is. But my suggestion is that it must at least go into your case file, your medical records. And obviously, whichever hospital you you are regularly following up with, you have to also confirm that they will accept it. Uh, I can speak for Hinduja. I know we can, but not. Uh, there are lots of people who are still unaware of this. Okay. And there's another consent, one question, uh, sir. Uh, consent from a person who is advancing towards neurological deterioration before going into complete dementia. Okay. So consent from them uh, also includes assessment of decision-making capacity. So we think that uh, up to mild dementia, uh, if somebody who has only forgetfulness but has not, uh, the trigger that we take is an MMSC of 24. Uh, up to an MMSC of 24, they can make that and they can be certified fit to make it. Between 24 and say about 16-ish or so, you need to actually find out if they understand this, if they know what the consequences are. And if they can tell you their wishes. So this is a process. We call that decision-making capacity. And we are we should be able to do that. Right. We have a case too, no, don't we? we won't yes, have yes. Time. Uh, we we can just, yeah. Sri Priya, we can go on to the case discussion, please. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, am I audible? Yes, please go ahead. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I have taken this case uh, uh, from uh, my ICU in, in my hospital, the neuro, neuro ICU. So the patient was a 59-year-old male. Uh, his diagnosis was a hemorrhagic stroke. Next. Uh, so his presenting complaints were loss of consciousness while he was reading a newspaper uh, four hours back and uh, there was difficulty in taking breath since two hours. Next. Uh, so to uh, go into deeper history, uh, the patient was a 59-year-old. He was apparently normal few hours back, uh, when that is four hours back, when he suddenly developed one episode of seizures while reading newspaper after the morning breakfast. There was a prolong of eyes. Seizures were generalized with abnormal movements all over the body. History of froth in the mouth was seen. Uh, the seizure's duration was 30 seconds and there was also bowel and bladder incontinence. Uh, the patient was unresponsive to family members since then. So uh, the breathing was also found abnormal by the family members as if he was gasping. The patient had multiple comorbidity, uh, comorbidities. He underwent PTCA one year back and there was also known case of COPD. Uh, he was also diabetic and hypertensive who was irregular in, on medications. Uh, and there was no surgical history as such. Next. Uh, on, upon examination, the patient was not conscious, was not responding to verbal commands. Uh, there was a gasping for breath seen. Uh, GCS was E1, V1, M2. His pupils were dilated and fixed. Uh, his heart rate was 50 beat per minute. Respiratory rate was eight, eight breaths per minute. BP was 170 by 90 and temperature was 37 degrees centigrade. Uh, respiratory uh, system also showed added sounds in the right upper lobe. Uh, so that could be aspiration because the patient was uh, full stomach before uh, this accident happened. And cardiovascular system was fine. Gastrointestinal system showed no abnormality. Coming to central nervous system, the GCS was low. Airway reflexes were absent and there was immediate need for airway protection and then uh, followed by imaging to rule out the CNS pathology. Next. What? The patient was, uh, so uh, the following treatment was given. Uh, the patient was immediately intubated because his GCS was low, uh, IV line was secured, all the blood investigations were drawn. He was shifted to CT uh, scan. CT report showed a large intraventricular bleed with a midline shift of 10 mm and diffuse cerebral edema. 
He also had sinus bradycardia, diffuse lung infiltrates. So uh, the neuro uh, medicine opinion was taken and uh, the conservative management was advised uh, to the family members because of the poor prognosis. So hmm. coming to... Uh, so can we, can we, can we, can we, wait, 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 wait. Yes, sir. So yes. Dr. Swayam. Yes, sir. So go back. Yeah, so neurology opinion taken, conservative management advice. Fair enough. How, how do you make these decisions? I mean, here obviously it was primarily a medical decision that was made. But how would you make this kind of decision? To be aggressive, to operate, not operate? Because this is the kind of patient, uh, I mean, I can imagine what it would look like. Yes, sir. You could potentially do what is called a decompressive craniectomy. Yes. Sir. And it's perhaps possible even to take out a fair amount of the blood as well. Yes, but sir. when it is an intracerebral hemorrhage, mm -hmm. uh, remember that the amount of brain that is damaged, it's like a bomb. So there's a lot of brain that will be damaged regardless of what you remove. Right. So how do you make this decision? So, I mean, who decides? Sir, uh, in my institute, the primary decision will be of a uh, primary treating physician. So, in this uh, case, do you agree? Call... Does everybody agree? Wait, 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 wait. Does everybody agree? No, I mean, in a sense, who are we to decide? Suppose it's the flip and the primary team says operate. Is that okay? Sir, uh, that should be uh, as per the uh, guidelines given for particular ailment. You have guidelines? Sorry. I don't know. Hinduja Hospital doesn't have any guidelines. Okay. Sorry. I'm not, I'm not going to <laughs> trouble you more. Remember that when you're making these decisions, there's a hierarchy for these decisions. The hierarchy is, one is patient's expressed wishes. Two is surrogate decision making. And third is called best wishes interests, uh, best wishes decision making. So, rather than us making, taking the burden of these decisions on, it has to actually take into account the patients and the family relations. Uh, there may be patients, obviously, I mean, if it is a public hospital, uh, Often the one that is taken into account first is best interest. Best interest, although we call it best interest, it actually takes the interest of the whole ecosystem around the patient into account. You have somebody who's poor, a laborer. It's obvious that there is no way that if you do this kind of great surgery, there is no way that that family is going to be able to take care of that patient. Right? Yes. But on the flip side, if you have a patient who at some stage has made it very clear that he wants to live regardless and the family also says, we want him, then you will have to follow that. Right? And yes. since these wishes are not often expressed, except when an advanced medical director is named, you go by what the surrogates think the patient would have decided if the patient were able to speak. Right? Yes. So, we have to be clear that these are not our decisions. And we run into trouble when we when we say that the decision was taken by the treating team. It's not our decision. Yes. Go on. Anybody has any questions, please ask. Can I ask one question? You said ahead, in this situation, um, because see, if the patient or the uh, surrogate not aware of anything, this new, as you said, no, the uh, if someone has prognosis. some management, prognosis. Uh, prognosis, they are not aware, they are not aware that it's going to be a long drawn process. Yes. There, even though they want, and see, as I said, it's a laborer, no affordability is there. Uh, they don't know, no affordability, don't know, but they want everything. There, what happens? So, the way I look at it, especially in neurological situations, um, I would give maximum therapy uh, 
in the first uh, few uh, days. I mean, I would take three to five days as the period for doing everything. Now, uh, if we go back, can we go back one slide? Yeah. So at this point, it was E1, V1, M2. Uh, M2 may have been extensor responses. The pupils were dilated and fixed. So here, actually, the patient is heading towards brain death. And it's quite likely by the time any decision is made, uh, criteria for brain, brain death will be met. If that is not so, if there is still some motor response, if uh, 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 the patient is somewhere about brain death, you still have the possibility of doing a decompressive surgery. Uh, but we know that any patient who is in coma for longer than six hours and has brainstem compromise. And here you have uh, the eye signs, you have ventilation, but more importantly, you also have, say, abnormal uh, uh, decorticate or decelerate posturing. Uh, we know that their likelihood of having a good outcome is probably of the order of under 5%. You can actually say that. Man. That this person becoming independent, I mean, there's a whole... There's a whole long discussion about that. We usually inform the family that the likelihood of this person being independent is probably less than 10%. I almost always, the first statement when I make, when I'm discussing this prognosis, I tell them that he or she will never be normal again. And I make that up front. Families are still thinking of miracles. They are lay people. They don't understand these things. You start off by saying, not be normal again. And then once you head into that discussion, the first discussion is usually at the bedside, just outside. It should, it can be hurried, but you have to have a sit-down discussion within 72 hours. This is a mandatory requirement worldwide. We don't seem to follow it. This is called the... Uh, it's, it's actually supposed to be led by the intensivist. And that is where all this discussion happens. If the patient is brain dead before that, you announce that. If the patient is stuck at a very low level, you announce that. And typically then decision-making flows beyond that. Yes, uh, Shikha Gupta exactly. raised your hand. Uh, I, I, I wanted to bring that because the 72-hour decision and revealing that they will not be as they would be before. This is what we used to fall. Yeah. All in so, care. Shikha, but Dr. Because Shikha no one raised, I thought it would be nice to get it from you. Thank you. Uh, sir, I will just narrate my personal experience way back in 2001. Uh, can, we, can we avoid that? We are almost at the end. Please let it's Sriya fine. finish. You are yeah. welcome to connect later. Uh, Dr. Chidanand, I mean, are you, was there a question? And yes, because I deal with neurocritical care. I thought, what, how okay. I go about it? I thought I... Yeah, yeah, please. So we'll again, we'll let Sriya has uh, the right of... Yeah. Yeah. So let her basically, first finish. Yeah, basically, what like see, these are all this, especially stroke. These are sudden yeah, yeah. event. Sudden event. I agree. So, have, so, have, so you have to have, have a process. We have comorbidities prior, whatever it is. Uh, I regular, understand. So there is there is a process. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's so go on. Let's go. Usually, on. what we do is we, at that time of point, we can convey to the family like what we have discussed. What is likely to be the output? And revisit again at seventy hours right. or ninety six hours, and then tell what Quite. we are going to look at at the uh, fire Quite. long term Quite. goal. At that Quite. time, that's where we set in the palliative care or the long term goal. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. Where so, I so, set so we'll 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 we can discuss that once Dr. Yeah. Sriya has finished. Right. Go on. So, uh, psychosocial aspects. Um, with these, thing, uh, with these findings, one can say that the patient's prognosis is really grave. So before discussion with the family, diagnosis should be ag uh, agreed by intensivist neurosurgeon and primary physician. First step is to disclose the condition to the family and not make an EOLC decision. Correct. 
so a honest accurate and early disclosure is also necessary like uh, we've discussed now less than 72 hours and the earlier awareness of poor prognosis to the family is the is better uh, this gives the family to be better prepared for the eolc decision as well next so uh, medications, there were a lot of medications going on to him, uh, but uh, the main goals of his treatment were this, after admitting into the intensive care unit, his blood pressure was being controlled. Uh, there was control of uh, uh, bleeding, hypothermia was given to him, sedation and barbiturate coma were followed. Next. What? So uh, now coming to concerns in this particular case, um, so the counseling of family members uh, with the utmost empathy was necessary. Uh, knowledge of imminent death should be given to the family members. All treatment modalities available and their futility at this juncture should also be explained. Complications arising due to increased intracranial tension uh, and that can ultimately lead to death should be explained. And unimproving conservative management initiation of EOLs. So to summarize, yes. uh, a 59-year-old patient uh, with a history of PTCA, diabetes, hypertension, and COPD uh, presents to the casualty with the loss of uh, consciousness and difficulty in breathing. After investigation, she was found to have massive uh, hemorrhagic stroke with impending herniation, poor prognosis, and possibility of imminent death to be disclosed to the family members. After obtaining uh, uh, consent, EOLC can be initiated. To be initiated. Mm. Uh, this will be the discussion points, like how to initiate main components of EOLC, um, EOLC pathway and development care. Right. Do we have time? We have only five minutes up. Sorry. <laughs> so Thank I'm you, sure we can come out of, of um, yeah. Yeah. We can come out of the screen, Sri Priya, so that... Uh, yeah. yeah. So I will have to leave. So unfortunately, for I'm sure there'll be questions and much to be discussed. But uh, anybody who's interested, there is always scope to learn with Pallium. Don't forget that. You have given answers for all that. All her main concerns have been covered in your topic. What, how to initiate, what to do, what is bereavement. And then the EOLC pathway. All the answers are there. In the, you have already taken us through them, sir. Can I Dr. Chidananda a... has raised his hand. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Quick Both. one, please. Quickly, quickly. I don't want to. No, sir, I just want to know. So we have, a, at the outset, in the initial phase, we have established DNR for a patient. Suppose okay. on the revisit, we feel the patient is improving. Can we revisit it and change the DNR documents? That's what I Of course, always. Right. This is shared decision making. You're speaking to the family. You can say that the prognosis has changed. Yeah. And that's why we use this period of trial period of maximal ICU therapy and so on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much sir for your precious time and such an excellent and elaborate one, every topic covered. And as you have, you have also shared your email and anyone keen yeah. can get in touch with you. And the course also there, and Dr. Chidananda may be interested because he's an intensive sure. Western neurologist. Thank you very much for the time and excellent uh, explanation on the topic. The course is for actually for everyone. In fact, I seem to find more interest from palliative care rather than neurologists. Neurologists, yes. unfortunately, think they know everything. <laughs> it's people in palliative care who are very keen to join up. So, yes, because uh, palliative care, anti- medicine, everything. Yeah. yeah. So virtual so, okay. program, sir? Yes, yes. So if you look at the details, you'll see it's, it's, oh, it's you, virtual. I mean, there's only one day which is uh, uh, where you have to actually make a physical presence. Thank you very much. We'll definitely get okay. in touch. Okay. Okay. Good day, good right. Day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Over to you, Sri Priya. Thank you, Dr. Roop. Thank you so much for joining us. We know you are having a very busy schedule, but still you managed to spend time with us. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, everyone, Thank for you. making the session interactive. Uh, with a humble, gentle reminder that the next is going to be our last session.
This is Sri Priya along with Dr. Rupu Sahani and Dr. Ratha Vandrishan signing off from the Tipsy Cohort. See you in the next session. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.